Kate Bornstein, uh, one of my favorite gender queer theorists, outlines uh, a few of a few ways to get us to think about how we might have sex without women or men, without women and men, and without sexual orientation. And Jacob Hale has done some very provocative work on this um, subject too. Uh, according to Bornstein, the notion of sexual orientation is a social construction that not only limits our sexual imagination, but it is also utterly reliant upon the gender binary. So she wants us to think about what desire would look like if maleness and femaleness were completely removed from the picture. And she has four very juicy models that she comes up with that I'm going to talk about here. Um, and they can stray off notes to talk about this. Okay, so the first model um, is the butch femme genderfuck model. This is a model where you totally let go of your ideas about who's a man and who's a woman. So you throw biological sex out the window. And instead you decide, what really gets me off is femininity, for instance. And so anybody who does femininity is a potential sex partner for me. That person could have a vagina, they could have a penis. What I'm after or some combination thereof. Um, but what I'm interested in is femininity. So you might say you like feminine women and feminine men. Or maybe you're attracted to masculinity, like I am. And uh, you want masculinity, masculine men or ma and masculine women. Or maybe your model is a gender queer model or a gender fuck model. What you're attracted to are people who in some way combine elements of, I guess that's really the more accurate description of my sexuality, is I like masculinity on female bodies. So, and for me, that's hot because I'm interested in uh, the unexpectedness of gender on a body. And that means that I also find uh, male bodies that incorporate femininity to be attractive. This is one of my favorite, uh, this is J.D. Sampson, one of my favorite, uh, I don't know, gender queer superstars. And part of what I like about her is that she, she's in a band called Latigra, the sort of techno pop punk feminist band. And part of what I like about her is that she's female identified, but she is very, very masculine. And often people who, um, you know, are somewhere on the sort of butch to F to M continuum of queerness uh, will want some kind of seamless appearance of their masculinity. But part of what I love about and find hot about J.D. Sampson is that she often puts herself in positions where you can very clearly see her female form. So you can see here a little bit of the outline of her breast, for instance. So she's um, female-bodied, but presenting with a lot of masculinity in a very genderqueer way. Another model where we can throw out biological sex and how we think about our desire is a top-bottom switch model. In this model, you would select your partners based on the kind of power arrangement that gets you off, right? So maybe you're attracted to really dominant people and you like to be passive. Or maybe you're attracted to really um, bottomy people because you like to be really bossy. That has nothing to do with penises or vaginas. You following me, right? This is another way to, something else that you could lead with. Some other way that we could have organized uh, sexuality in our culture. But we didn't do this. Instead, we made sexual orientations all about gender. You following me? Okay. I include this image of Kurt from Glee because part of what's so hot, what, or part of what I think is hot, the hot thing about this image, is not that it's a gay male image. What's hot about this image is the power that is exuded in this image, right? Is here's little Kurt from Glee, and he's about to be like ravaged by these like leather daddies, right? That's what's hot about the image, is you are like, oh, you feel for him about what is going to happen, which is both scary and extremely hot. Um, okay, a third model uh, where we can get rid of men and women and instead select our sexual partners based on people who share uh, our interest in particular kinds of scenes or erotic role play. So this is a like a, a fantasies model, a role play model. So let's say you're interested in uh, Catwoman. Uh, you're in 
interested in playing doctor, you're interested in prison and prisoner guard, you're interested, whatever it is, this kind of a scene, a scenario, a fantasy that is important to you, you would be open to any person who would want to enact that scene with you. Again, having nothing to do with penises or vaginas. And then a third model you may be familiar with uh, is a sex acts model. In this uh, system, you would select partners based on the kinds of sex, particular sex acts that you wanted to engage in. And um, how many of you are familiar with the Hanky Code? Okay, so for those of you who are not, the Hanky Code emerges out of <coughs> gay male leather culture, and it's basically a system for articulating these desires or, uh, you know, uh, uh, displaying these desires, what's it called, advertising these desires. And what, what you do is you learn the code. There's a hanky, a colored handkerchief, that is attached to or represents, symbolizes each of this, these possible sex acts and you wear it in your pocket. And so, for instance, light blue means that you are into cock sucking, robin means egg blue, 69, medium blue, you're into cock role play, navy blue, you like to, you, you want fucking, uh, teal blue, cock and ball torture, obviously this is sort of mostly male oriented, however, you know, anyone who can just go to the pleasure chest and buy a strap on can do any of these things. Um, dark pink, tin torturer. Uh, the other element of the Hanky Code that's important is that, and it gets very creative, and now the Hanky Code is like an encyclopedia. It's like 5,000 pages long. Um, because that's how creative we could be about our sexuality. But if you want, in addition to articulating the, the act that you're interested in, you also flag whether you want this thing done to you or whether you want to do it to somebody. You want it done to you, you wear your hanky on the right. If you want to do it to somebody, you wear your hanky on the left. Then you walk through the Castro and uh, communicate on your butt all of this incredible information about yourself. Um, so the idea here is that these ways of organizing sexuality are not dependent upon the sex or genitals of the participants. These models don't require us to announce, I am a woman who will have sex with women and men, for instance. Instead, they announce, I have this particular desire right now. I have this particular desire right now. These models foreground desire in a way that leaves ample room for play and for change. And I think these models highlight the short-sightedness of attempts to reduce desire to biology. For instance, if the hanky code were to be the, our primary erotic system, if it was the way that we had decided to organize sexuality instead of the way we do, then scientists would need to find in the body different indicators for dozens upon dozens of sexual possibilities. They'd have to find the gene for boot licking. They'd have to find the gene for nipple play. They'd have to find the gene for oral sex, masturbation, and dirty talk. And on and on and on. Currently, the science of sexual orientation is enabled precisely by the simplicity of our thinking about sexual possibilities, or the way that we have reduced them to three options, gay, straight, bisexual. We have also reduced the concept of sexual fluidity, a very broad and compelling concept, to bisexuality, or to a pretty narrow dimension of dual gender preference. So, to conclude, we might think about bisexual politics as an aspiration for something that was not fully realized, at least not under the moniker bisexual. Clearly, many people, including young people, continue to identify as bisexual, but they are choosing now from a much broader array of terms and political subjectivities, including some, like queer and genderqueer, which they understand to speak far more directly than bisexual does, to multiple fluidities of gender and sexuality. 
So to the extent that I would argue for a recuperation of bisexual politics, I would want to imagine it as an arm of queer critique that draws strength from people's particular fears about it, and not from its capacity to be normalized by science. As I hinted at earlier, if what people fear most about bisexuality is that it refuses to choose, or that it looks like one thing but could be the next, uh, uh, on the next day, then these are precisely its most important, its most powerful weapons in the struggle against sexual normativity. We might embrace the amazing fact that bisexuals are remarkably resistant to commodification. They are virtually invisible in the media because capital does not invest in complexity and unpredictability. In other words, the story of bisexuality is too complex for dominant modes of representation. We could complain about this, or we could celebrate queer bisexuality as one of the last domains unpenetrated by, uh, by capital or by the corporate world or corporate media. But perhaps the most vital contribution that people with gender fluid desire bring to the queer movement is to shift our attention away from sexual identities organized around desire for women and men and toward the transgressive possibilities of sex beyond the gender binary or love beyond gender. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you to the church and to the youth task force and the bi task force, the task forces, <laughs> good, and, um, and to Stephanie Ballard for doing the legwork for this event. Thank you so much. This is definitely the first time I have talked about anal fisting in a church sanctuary. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, and that subject may come up later to talk.